Good morning. College football started. But I'm an Oregon fan. It was rough. It was a rough night. Rough night for me. But it's good to be with you guys this morning. We got baptism this morning. Both services. About 10 people getting baptized today, which is super exciting and fun. Um, and uh, we're going to be working through Ephesians again. If you want to grab a Bible and turn to Ephesians 5, uh, we're going to be there. It's page 800 if you have one of these Bibles. If you don't, good luck. Um, and uh, yeah, Ephesians 5, but also life groups, life groups, life groups, life groups. Did I mention life groups? Life groups? Life groups? Life groups? It's kind of maybe a weird phrase, life groups, but basically it's just small groups of people that are trying to get together outside of a Sunday morning context to check in on each other, pray for each other. Actually, the four things that we're dreaming and praying for you is that you'll get raw authenticity and the kind of healing that comes with that. You'll get relentless encouragement from each other because we definitely need that. You'll get biblical counsel in those, in those small groups and you'll get just some genuine friendship. Um, not the online kind, the in face-to-face kind or whatever. Online, that's cool. You can do that too, but um, face-to-face is important as well. But life groups are going on. We actually have over 200 people that have signed up since last Sunday. Yeah, you can, there's a lot of wooing going on around here. Um, but we, do, we, we just we think it's really important. We are not trying to build a Sunday morning show. That is the last thing we are trying to build around here, where people come for an hour, they watch a show, and then go. We, do not want, we are not in that business. We do not want to see that be what we build. We're trying to build a church. And it is so important that the church has more than a Sunday morning to stand on. We've got to find ways, and I don't care if you find life groups in another church, whatever, you've got to find ways to get together with people in smaller settings to where you can be known and you can impart the wisdom God is speaking to you and you can be supported. So, anyways, did I mention life groups? Yeah, it's very easy. You go online, livingstreams.org, and you've got a whole list of them. they got times, locations, what's happening there. Um, we're asking everyone in our church, everyone, well, if you, this is your first Sunday, hey, you're in. You, you came. It's your fault. Um, to at least sign up for six weeks, starting September 15th, we basically have leaders, we have groups, we have everything ready. We even gave the leaders their first snacks for the first night. We're serious about this thing. Um, and we're serious about snacks, too. But, uh, but, yeah, so at least just give it six weeks. The leaders are going to be there, and they're, they're all ready for to run past six, six weeks, but we, we just really want you guys to give it a shot and see what the Lord can do. We don't want to miss anything that God has in store for us. So, did I mention <laughs> life groups? Yeah, I think I did. All right, did I mention college football in Oregon? <laughs> yeah, I did that. All right, so we're going to be in Ephesians. We're, lo- we're looking at Paul's vision of the church. Now, he didn't have a vision for Living Streams Church. Living Streams is just an organization that has men and women that are leading it. And the church that Jesus Christ gave birth to by his blood, and, and the vision that Paul said is the church organism. It is the thing that lives on beyond Living Streams. It was the thing that was there before Living Streams or whatever other church you might be a part of. And, and we build these organizations, these churches that are hopefully going to help that organism prosper and thrive within it. But you are the church if you are called by Jesus' name. You are the church, and the church is the single most dominant force for good that the world has ever seen, any era, any age, any place. No one can deny the power of what the church, the true church, has done. At the same time, no one can deny that there has been real good seasons and real bad seasons for the organization aspect of the church. There have been horrible seasons when we look at the organization of the church. But Jesus is not the head of the organizations. We do our best to make sure he is in control of this place. But at the end of the day, it's got to go through people like me. And it's going to come out a little squirrely. 
but he is and always will be the head of the church, which is his body here on earth. And every one of you has a part to play. So Paul is trying to impart to us this vision, this grand vision, this vision that when he got it, he did not want it. But when he got it, he changed every single thing in his life. He threw away everything he had ever known and become, position, power, money, self-righteousness, pride, He threw it all away and said, I just want to live into this vision. And he spent the rest of his life traveling the world to tell Gentiles, people who are not Jews, about this vision that God has for them. In Ephesians, he kind of tries to piece it all together in this letter that he was writing. And it's so ridiculous. If you were to get this letter back in Paul's day, you would think the guy is insane. You would think he's absolutely crazy because what he is putting forth in this vision and what was in reality at that time of the church are so far apart. If you get nothing else from our time in the book of Ephesians, I just want you to get this. That Paul was declaring something that had no chance of becoming a reality. The church at that time was scattered, was living in caves and dens, it was persecuted, it was dominated. It was a laughing stock. It was pitiful. And yet Paul could see something that Marty Caldwell gets to see all the time as he travels around. That other people, we have someone speaking next week who's been around the world seeing the church in action in all different continents. And he's going to share a little bit of her strength and beauty these days. If Paul could see the church today, he would do an old man backflip, <laughs> which is kind of like rolling over, I think, <laughs> or falling down maybe. But, I mean, I, what the church has become, there is no way Paul could actually have believed that it would be what it is today. She is so beautiful. But Paul could see a vision, kind of like when we talk about Martin Luther King Jr. as he goes and he speaks before that crowd right before he was killed. And he said, I have no worries. For I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen the other side. I've seen the promised land. I know we're going to get there. And that's basically what Paul is saying in his day and age. He's saying, I've seen the vision, Jesus has given me the vision, and now I'm living into the vision, and I'm going to see us grow from this tiny little infant baby that is not even having a chance to live, forsaken in every way, is going to become the most powerful thing the world has ever seen. It's awesome what we are reading right now. And I'm hoping that it will kind of get in us and... um, so I, I've had a couple visions in my life. <laughs> um, when I first gave my life to Jesus, I was about 18 years old. When I, when I first gave my life to Jesus. I had received Jesus prior to that, but there was a big difference um, when I turned 17 and 18 right in there where I think Jesus was saying, okay, now I'm going to ask something from you. And, and I went for it. And uh, immediately... Mike, you can attest to this. I just, for some reason, started thinking about Ireland all the time. I'd actually gotten to go to Ireland with my family right after I graduated, so I just thought that's all it was. And, and yet this, this kind of, this idea of Ireland and going to Ireland and, and starting a camp and, and for summer, like a summer camp type thing, and, and then also starting a church and having a school there, kind of all on the same property. It was just this vision. It just started coming to me, and I didn't... I, I mean, again, I'd been to Ireland. My grandmother was Irish. I, I mean, I do, I do have Irish citizenship. I have dual citizenship through her. Um, so I kind of started going, well, maybe there's something here. Man. And I just had this compelling vision of going to Ireland and getting rid of all the snakes. Not really. That was somebody else's vision. But, but going to Ireland and trying to see the Lord do something. And uh, so I graduated college, and I talked to some friends who were crazy enough to say, let's do it. And we came up with a plan. I was going to go to Ireland. We were all going to go for three months. We bought a three-month ticket. That was the entirety of the plan. And we were just going to see what the Lord would do. And I'm here in Arizona now, right, working here, you know. 
Um, but we did go there. We got to see the Lord do really great things. It was very strengthening for our faith. Within three days, we had jobs. We had a place to live. And our name was being sent to all these different ministry clubs in Northern Ireland. And we got to go two or three times a week, get on a bus and say, could you take us to this place and do ministry and all those things? And then at the end of it, though, we were like, well, we should go home. <laughs> and it was a great time. It was building in my faith. But then we came back. Then I had another vision. I was sitting right down here one time, right by Mark Buckley as he was about to preach, and we were singing the song, For the Sake of the World, Burn Like a Fire in Me. And I, I mean, I can't tell you how clear it was. I just saw this vision of a bunch of Belizeans. And I, my wife and I had lived in Belize for a little bit before, so it wasn't that far off. But I saw a, a room full of Belizeans, and they were saying, singing, For the Sake of Belize, Burn Like a Fire in Me. And it was just real clear, and it was, it was, it, it was, it was a vision. And, and so I remember talking to Mark about it and the elders and saying, hey, you know, my wife and I are thinking maybe we should go to Belize again. And uh, Mark rolled his eyes and said, man, why well, you got to keep doing this trash? No, he didn't say that. He was like, okay, 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 let's figure this out. Um, and, and sure enough, we did end up going to Belize for a year. It ended up being a little more than a year uh, with our family and, and just... Step by step, we started a Friday night fire, is what they wanted to call it, except for in Belize, it's Friday night fire. <laughs> um, and we started a little worship night, and my wife and I were doing music, which is not that impressive. Um, and and, sh and we, we, would, we started using that song to close every one of the Friday nights that we had, and, um, and we did. We changed the word. I don't know if we're allowed to, but it was Belize. You get away with anything. Um, but we changed the words, and... and and I thought, wow, this is amazing, because little by little, you know, the room started to fill up, and uh, people were singing that song. And then the Lord, just to make it so clear that I didn't miss it, there was one night where it was just totally jam-packed. Um, I mean, this is like probably 100 or something, religions. It's not, I mean, it was a small room, so it was jam-packed. Um, and we're singing that song, and it was just a, a great night, and you know, we're just really leaning into the Lord. And all of a sudden, the power went out completely. And when the power goes out in Belize, it's like, it was, there was, it was dark. It was so dark, you couldn't even see anything um, inside this room. And it was very hot. Um, and yet, the power goes out, and our mics, everything's gone, and everyone just kept singing. And we were just at the part where we sing, For the sake of Belize, burn like a fire in me. And I just stepped back from the mic for just a second and just went, oh my goodness. It was like the Lord was saying, no, 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 we're not doing this. Little. We're making a point of this, exclamation point, boom. And so there's these visions that the Lord gives us, and Paul was so compelled by this vision of, of what he was going to see. And I, I don't know if he ever got to a point where he, said he felt like he got to see it. I mean, I think he probably saw little pieces of it. But again, Ephesians is this grand vision that he's trying to lay out for all of us. And, and he starts off giving us a vision of, of the church as a family, that we've been adopted into God's heart. So the church is one of the ways that we can see this vision. One of the ways Paul saw it is it's like the family of God. We've got the name of God on our jerseys on the back. We walk around and are learning how to live according to his family rules and culture. And then he goes on to talk about how the church is the dwelling place of God, that somehow his dwelling, his spirit is in all of us. And as we go about the world, God's presence goes into all the world and is a picture of what God can do. And when people come and get to know us, it's like coming over to God's house and hanging out for a while. And then he, we talked last week about the church as a body, that we're this body that, that, that we're trying to grow into this full stature this amazing, powerful force that, that God has in mind for us to be. And, and we start at one point and we try and grow into it so that we can be strong enough to with, withstand the winds of every deceitful scheme that comes our way, that we won't be tossed to and fro by the waves. And that's the, the dream that we have. And today, we're going to talk about the church as a bride. So all the girls are like, oh, yeah, this is cool. And all the guys are like, College football, man. College football. All right, so Ephesians chapter 5. you got to deal with it. It's in the Bible, so get ready. Get your wedding dresses out. Chapter 5, verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, 
and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So there you have fragrance, right? We're already getting girly. But Jesus gave, he loved us, and he gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering. And then he says in verse 3, but among you there must be not even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people or for God's bride. Right? And then let's skip down to verse 21. He says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body or his bride, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And husbands, you should love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife actually loves himself. It's good for you. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And then Paul says this as a little bit of a hesitation caveat. Now this is a profound mystery. But I am talking about Christ and the church. So all this stuff about submission, all this stuff about two becoming one. He's saying, now I need you to just pay attention here. I'm not trying to be weird, but somehow this is a mystery All of this stuff that I'm talking about is actually about Christ and his church, his bride, the people who follow him. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So Paul opens up this whole can of worms and basically saying, now another way that I want you to picture the church is it is the bride of Christ. It is the people he has chosen, the people that he has given his life for and will forevermore, the, the, the person, the, the people that he is actually trying to love so well that they actually form into all the beauty that they can form into. He's talking about how Christ and his body are to become one in loving kindness and mutual respect. And again, John 17 is a, is a prayer that if Jesus didn't pray it, I would never really teach it. But Jesus says in John 17 that his prayer is that those who, come, who, who believe in him would become one with him just like he and the Father are one. Now you see, this is profound. It's not saying that we're going to become gods in no way. But somehow we're going to be included into the Trinitarian love and oneness as we follow him. It's a profound mystery. And I'm not going to talk about it anymore because I have no idea what else to say about it. I'm just going to one day die and bam, in it. Yes, this is rad. I love it. Thank you for not making me wear a wedding dress. This is so cool. If I wear a wedding dress, I'll just be, I'll be a good guy, so I'll be okay with it. Whatever, I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> profound mystery. I like that Paul says that, and he was like super Bible guy, so I can just call it a profound mystery. Um, but anyways, we're talking about this love. We're talking about the romance. We're talking about how God actually, in Christ, romanced us. Reckless love, whatever you want to talk about. He wooed us. Romeo and Juliet, all of the stuff you want to say here. <sighs> and it's fun for me to talk to guys um, when we go on men's retreats or Belize retreats if I get to know them. Because I love to just ask the question, like, do you have a girlfriend if they're not married? And it's so funny because immediately I just feel like, bam, you are in. You know, unless they're like, no, don't talk to me about that. I don't know you. Um, but if they start to answer that question at all, they can't help it. But their heart is coming right out of their mouth. 
And it's like, bam, you get to see their heart right away, whether it's good, bad, or whatever, because that's a big part of where their life is flowing out of, is that part of their heart that longs for that companionship. And then I love to ask guys on our men's retreats, men's retreat, we were in Belize, and last time I asked the guys, I was like, all right, what we're going to do tonight is kind of a debrief, is I want everyone to tell, you how you, tell us how you got engaged. And you can see all the guys like, what do you mean? And then they start telling it, and they're just struggling, like, you know, they're like trying to make it not a big deal, but then as they tell the story, all of a sudden they start gushing a bit. It's like, oh, you're sappy. Yeah, you are a romantic guy. Yeah, look at you. Ha ha, we got you busted. But, they, but as they tell the story, it's like they, it just it comes out. And it's so precious and beautiful. Even the guys who are like, you know, so tough, then they're just like when they're talking about getting engaged, it's just an awesome, awesome thing. And uh, for me, I fell in love with this girl named Britt, um, and uh, she and I were dating and hanging out. This is my wife, by the way. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and yet, at the same time, I knew she also loved another, and it was the kids in South Africa. She loved them a lot, and she knew that she needed to go to them. And so we started dating, and we were hanging out, and I was like, yeah, we love each other, but I know you love these little kids in Africa. Um, and so I, we knew she had to go, and so she went. And, the, and a big thing was she was going to see, you know, she loved the Lord above it all, and she wanted to go where God was leading her. And so she went for a few months to Africa, and I didn't know what was going to happen. Would she love me more than Africa? And would God put our paths back together at some point? And it was a real moment of truth. And then I remember talking to her you know, all of the time when she was there. And uh, at one point, it was pretty clear what she was saying was that she loved me more than Africa. And that's a big deal for my life, by the way. <laughs> I was like, God, all of Africa beat? Yeah! You know, um, <laughs> I was thrilled, and so um, knowing that, I ended up getting on a plane and flying to London where she was going to be flying back, and I surprised her. I surprised her by being in London. She didn't know I was going to be there, and I surprised her by looking like this, um, right there. <laughs> Like, she was going, and I said, well, I'm not going to cut my hair while you're gone, you know, so cool or whatever. But then I didn't think about this part. <laughs> so I got, I mean, it was, yeah. So she was like, oh, hey, oh, hey. <laughs> um, and then I surprised her one more, and I got on my knee, and I asked her to marry me. And uh, she said yes, and almost 15 years. It's a pretty cool deal. Um, but... Yeah, hey, thank you. Um, but, but I'm saying all of this because Jesus loves you in this way. If you can receive it. He loves you and wants so badly for you to love him. Not only for his own good, somehow, mystery of mysteries, if you love Jesus, his heart is full. And if you don't, his heart is broken. God of the universe, creator of everything, has somehow made his, his heart dependent on your love. And if you choose to love him, you will be loved well. And there's some verses in Ephesians that kind of bring this out, and I want to go through these things, and I just want you to maybe grab a couple things out of these. Maybe write them down, maybe just hide them in your heart, but there's some phrases that are real key as we go through. I want to start in Ephesians chapter 2, um, verse 1, and I'm going to read this out of the message translation, so you can follow along in the NIV, but it'll be a little different, because um, I like the way the NIV says it. It says, it wasn't so long ago that you were mired in that old, stagnant life of sin. You weren't anything that special. 
You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. It's powerful imagery. We all did it, all of us doing what we felt like doing when we felt like doing it, all of us in the same boat. We loved a lot of other things. And it's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us. Instead, immense in mercy and with incredible love, he embraced us. He walked right up to our filthiness and our rebellion and our anger, and he hugged us. He pulled us close to him and stole it all away. He took our sin-dead lives with no help from us. He picked us up and set us down in highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. Now God has us where he wants us. This isn't on the screen. This is the next verse. I don't think. Yeah. Now God has us where he wants us, verse 7, with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us. That is what Jesus is longing to do, to bring you close to him, to shower you with loving kindness both in this world and in the next. And just so you know, there won't be pain in the next. Here you get both. The next verse is Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 14. This is out of the NAV, so you can follow along in your Bible. Therefore remember that formerly you are, who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves circumcision. I mean, those who are feeling like they're up at up the upper class and you were lower class, called by them. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. This is where God found you. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, all the way into his arms, pressed against his own chest, covered by his love, never needing to fear or worry again. Perfect, redeeming love is wrapped around you in Christ Jesus. I defined it a little bit like this. The way that God treats us as his bride, lovingly, romantically, faithfully, kindly, what happens is our vulnerability is met with his passionate, wholehearted, generous covering. He finds us naked and ashamed, and he covers us with his righteousness and love. His love really does redeem. Let's go on to the next one, Ephesians 5, 1 through 3. Now, this is important because Paul says this here as he's kind of giving us all of this. Ephesians 5, verse 1 through 3. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for, for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among, among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity. Why is the Bible so serious about sexuality? Why is the world disparaging and rebelling against the scriptures right now because it's too harsh or too hard? Well, because the writers of the Bible are trying to help us understand that there's really two images that God has given us outside of Christ incarnate that teach us about him better than anything else. Genesis 1 makes it very clear that God created male and female in his image. So if we get male and female right, then the world gets to see God. If we screw up or twist up male and female, we lose one of our most powerful demonstrations of who God is. In full, God is not male. Never has been, never will be. God is not female. He is somehow the fullness of both of those when we get it right. And that's why there's a big attack right now but it's not the first time we go through this attack, generation after generation, where the devil tries to destroy our image of God found in maleness and femaleness. 
And we do need to sit back and weather the storm with love and kindness, but we also need to make sure people understand God put the fence there for a reason. And if you move the fence, you're going to find the lions, the tigers, and the bears ready to devour you, which we see over and over and over again. That's why the world and society has never really been able to move on to this total free love thing because ultimately the consequences show up and we go back. This isn't a new thing. This is just the latest wrong version of woke that we're going to have to wake up from with consequences all around us. The Bible is the only thing woke. And not only that, but he also says that the second thing that, that is the best image of God is marriage. Marriage is, is the second best image of God. I'm talking about Christ in the church. You want to learn about Christ in the church? Go look at someone's marriage. That's how you're going to learn about the love of God, the faithfulness, the stick to itness, the perseverance, the patience, the kindness. It's the way God loves you, except for he's perfect and totally trustworthy. So why would the enemy want to destroy marriage? Why would he want us to get rid of that or call that crazy or too hard? Because he doesn't want people to see the image of Christ in his church because they might fall in love with him and experience his love. Anyways, the last thing I want to read as we close is Ephesians 5, 21 through 33, that same passage, but I want to read it in the message translation. And I want to highlight a couple things. And I ask that you just, again, try and grab a couple things for your own heart right now. This is the way the message says it. Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to the church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. And then husbands, go all out in love for your wives. Be extravagant like Jesus was, exactly as Christ did for the church. And now check this love out. It's a love marked by giving, not getting. Christ's love actually makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her, dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. And that is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favor since they're already one in marriage. And we'll just finish with that. I love some of those phrases. That this is the love that Christ has for us. It's the love that we're supposed to do towards our spouses, towards our kids, towards our friends, towards our enemies, towards our neighbors. This kind of love that, that is marked by giving, not getting. The kind of love that makes the person that we're loving more whole. Doesn't point out their deficiencies, but it actually begins to fill those things. And cover those things until they have a chance to grow into those things. And their words evoke their beauty. Man, I want to love my wife like that. And I'm so bad at it. I want to love my kids like that. And I know I fall short. I want to love you guys like that. It's a beautiful love that Jesus has for us. It's a life-changing, redeeming love. It's a love that feels like vulnerability met with passionate, wholehearted, generous covering. And as I was worshiping downstairs with the team, there was just this moment where I saw this picture basically of of some people who are feeling pretty vulnerable, pretty gross, pretty bad about themselves, pretty unsure, pretty weak, whatever it might be. And Jesus comes and he actually covers you with his robes of righteousness, of love. He wraps this covering around you. And then when you look in the mirror, you're like, wow, I didn't know I could look like this. But the story wasn't over. Because at one point that robe was removed and no longer was there something disgusting underneath. Now it was like you had your own form of beauty. You had your own form of strength. 
It was Christ in you, that hope of glory was there. So the covering doesn't just cover up your sickness to make you feel better for a moment, but that covering actually redeems everything underneath the covering, stirs up, evokes the beauty that he made for you to be. His innocent love causes that kind of change. And it's hard to abide in Christ. It's hard to keep absorbing that love from time to time. But that's the only way that we're going to be able to love like him. We can't do it in our own strength. Never can, never will. But Jesus knows that. So if we will set aside time to go and sit in his presence and allow him to robe us once again, if we can put on Jesus Christ and be robed in his righteousness, we will absorb that love that will reform us and fill us so that we can then go and clothe others in this world. That's a beautiful vision of Christ and his church, Christ and his bride. You are the bride of Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, we do thank you so much that you love us, that you gave yourself for us in ways beyond what we could imagine. And I pray that, Lord, once again, we would allow you to cover us so that you can cleanse us and transform us and fill us so that we can go into this world and we can cover others with that same love. Thank you, Lord. Now, if you're in this place and everyone's going to bow their heads and keep their eyes closed just to create a little moment between you and God, if, if you're in a place where you, you're saying that you've never been clothed, in the love of Christ or wrapped up in his righteousness and today you want to make that decision. I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand between you and the Lord. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else or do something weird. We're just asking you to respond to his invitation right now. He loves you just the way you are and he can cover you and cleanse you and wash you. And if you're ready, if you're bold enough to say, I need that today, then you can raise up your hand. Okay, awesome. Anyone else? Yeah, in the back, awesome. Anyone else? Awesome. Well, Lord Jesus, we do thank you that you receive us. And I pray that, that the profound mystery of all of this would become extra close and extra clear to these who've raised their hand this morning. That they would know the next step. You would meet them, Lord. You would send people their way. They would make it all the way in, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, along those same lines, we have a special deal going on. Kurt is going to come on up and lead us into a time of baptism where people are making a public profession of their commitment to Christ. Um.